Hi everyone and welcome to our Ask Me Anything show. My name is Frances Hume and I work for a charity called Interfaith Scotland. Over the last few weeks we have been asking pupils from primary and secondary schools to send in questions that they would like answered by people from different faiths. Now today I'm delighted to have two people with me from two different faiths. I have Nicola Mole and Nicola is a Buddhist in a Tibetan Buddhist tradition. She lives in Glasgow and she has her own business. We also have Aparna Ramesh. Aparna is a Hindu. She lives in Glasgow too and works with me at Interfaith Scotland, but is currently in India because of lockdown. So it's great to have you both here with us today. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to just very briefly tell us a little bit about your religion and then we'll get on to the questions. So Nicola, can you tell us a little bit please about Buddhism? So Buddhism is a spiritual tradition and a religion that's followed by people all over the world and is based on the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. So there are many different versions of the Buddha's life, but they all tell the story of Prince Siddhartha, as he was then known, and he was moved by the suffering that he saw round about him. So through meditation, he worked at overcoming obstacles, both inner and in, in his mind and in the outer world, eh, to understand what causes happiness and suffering. And when he realised this, he became known as the Buddha. Thank you, Nicola. So Aparna, can you tell us a little bit about Hinduism, please? Okay. So one of the most interesting facts about Hinduism is that it's considered one of the oldest known religions. Uh, it's said that Hinduism has been around for from beyond 3000 BCE and that's quite you know quite a long time ago and uh, this is because Hinduism rather than as a religion it started simply as a way of life of the people in the Indian subcontinent so that would be all that uh, well, back then it wasn't separated as, you know, India, China, Sri Lanka and all that. It was just south of Asia, all that region. So nowadays Hinduism is found all, everywhere around the world. Uh, but of course, ma majorly known that, you know, Hinduism is practiced more widely in uh, Asian countries. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I'm on to my first question now, and this comes from pupils at St. Dennis Primary School in Glasgow. So I'll ask you first, Nicola, mm -hmm. how many gods do you have in your religion? So personally, I don't believe in a creator god, a single creator god. And, and it's, it's my understanding within Buddhism that that's the same. So as a, Buddha, a Buddhist, we say that you have Buddha nature. So we look inwards. Um, rather than seeking something outwards, um, something that's out there. Great, thank you. And how about you, Aparna? How many gods do you have in Hinduism? Okay, so in Hinduism, the main thing is that God is considered as omnipresent, present everywhere. And this God we represent, uh, we imagine it's a form of the energy that is present throughout the universe. And we have a syllable rather than a word, I would say a syllable. Uh, we call it Om. So A U M, if you write it, is in the English uh, letters. And this is a very symbolic way, as in because when you say the syllable Om, so you start, op you open your mouth, you sustain the sound for a bit, and then you close your mouth. So that signifies, you know, how creation happen and just you know basically life as it because you're born and then you live your life and then it uh, your uh, you know old age and all that so uh, after that finally death so that is what it symbolizes overall but of course Hinduism is known to have a lot of gods and by probably a very rough tally it is said to be around 330 million gods so these gods are now basically considered as a representation of, you know, our wishes, our prayers. So, you know, we have a goddess who, will, who we pray to before, uh, you know, uh, for strength, for knowledge. We have Saraswati who's knowledge. And a very interesting fact that I always like to say is in Hinduism, uh, we have a goddess of warriors. We don't have a god of warriors. We have a goddess of warriors. 
we have a goddess for knowledge so you know all the important things in life we have goddesses and um, we have three main gods brahma vishnu and shiva and uh, everybody else is uh, we and each one has an attribute assigned to them to which we pray to we have a god who is a remover of obstacles so we uh, that is why it is considered as so many gods in hinduism but personally my belief is they are just manifestations of the same energy pool okay thank you very interesting so the next question is did you choose your own religion or did you fa follow your family's religion and i'll go to nicola again first for that so i was christened um within the church of scotland and my parents were not particularly drawn to the church so it didn't play a large part uh, in my life growing up but as i became a teenager i started to question things i was always interested in jesus and the saints but i started to question things in my own mind um, so I decided to become a bit of a spiritual tourist and I um, visited quite a few different Buddhist traditions um, within Glasgow and it was on hearing um, an, uh, well, a, a teacher called Lama Geshe Losal uh, in Glasgow that I suddenly thought ah, this makes sense to me. So um, I wanted to learn more about Tibetan Buddhism um, which has a, a very strong um, tradition of um, relying on the personal Lama or Guru or teacher all mean the same thing. Um, and I was very lucky to have found um, sort of true, true authentic teachers um, that I try to hold in, in my mind at every moment of every day. <laughs> Great, thank you. And how about you, Aparna? Okay, so for me, I have uh, followed my family's religion. My parents are Hindus, my grandparents are as well. And it's just um, ancestral, I would say. Um, I had a lot of a uh, little difficulty with that maybe in my teenage years when you know due to peer pressure and you know uh, trying to and you know uh, trying to fit in with popular idea and opinions uh, uh, you know made uh, made my faith a little it took a little bit of a back seat in comparison to my uh, school life uh, but then I think really when it came down to it, it was in university when I, uh, you know, started getting, uh, getting back to, you know, being much more involved in my faith and having faith play such a big part in my life because at university, all the stuff about, um, you know, the stress of studies and all that, uh, it provided a relief to me to visit temples and praying and meditation. That was what provided a lot of stress release to me. So I took a lot of solace in visiting temples and just sitting quietly in a quiet spot. And yeah, uh, I've never turned back from that. And I openly embrace the fact that uh, I have a faith now. Great, thank you. I think I'll maybe ask you this, uh, the next question, Aparna, because it kind of leads on from that. And that question is, what do you like about your religion? Oh, well, I think the best thing that any Hindu, I think, would say about what they like about their religion is that there are so many festivals. So we have so many festivals throughout the year and everything, uh, and during festival time, everything is so colorful and new and just, you know, enjoyable. So as a kid, the fact, well, the fact about festivals that I liked the most was that we used to get the days off in school. It was a holiday when any festival came around. So that was a great uh, bonus for it. And we got to dress up in new clothes and uh, eat a lot of sweets. And that was a time you could just indulge uh, and nobody would say anything because at home they would cook and cook and obviously somebody had to eat all that. <laughs> so, uh, and then obviously visiting family because uh, around festival time, obviously when you get the school off, that's when you get the time to visit your grandparents. So all of my cousins, everybody we used to meet together at our grandparents' place to celebrate all these festivals together, which was so much fun. And, you know, now that's uh, obviously with the lockdown and, you know, worldwide the pandemic, we can't do that this year, which we've been really missing out on. But, it, you know, those are fond memories of childhood. Uh, now, as an adult, the, you know, community involvement and interaction that happens uh, during festivals is a big, big bonus. And uh, it has that sense of, you know, togetherness uh, that uh, re I really enjoy. Great. Thank you. Sounds great. 
Uh, and how about you, Nicola? Well, um, well for me, Tibetan Buddhism offers a path, um, and it's a method to understanding um, suffering and how our mind really works. So it's a very embracing path for anyone. No one is excluded from being a Buddhist, not even people of other religions. Um, anybody can be a Buddhist and it discrimi discriminates against no one. And after all, we do share the same common thing, which is being a human being. So I also like very much um, the invitation to practice and experience for ourselves. It's all very much in our hands. So. Okay, thank you. So my next question is, how do you pray? Why do you pray? And what is it like to pray? So I'll go to you, Nicola. Okay. <laughs> um, so there are actually quite, there's a lot of prayers and um, practices within the Kaju tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, which is the lineage um, um, that, I, that I'm within, that I practice within. Uh, I don't actually know them all, there's so many, um, I don't know them personally. Um, however, there is a prayer that I say every day, which is often referred to as the Kaju um, lineage prayer. And it is a wish, it's an aspiration, and then it offers instructions within the prayers of how to practice. It's a teaching, essentially. So, and um, that's one prayer that I would say daily. The other prayer, um, would be a dedication prayer. So after I've done, a, I've attended a teaching or listened to the teachings, um, or I've sat down and, and um, sat in some meditation, I would um, dedicate whatever merit, so whatever benefit that I got from that practice, I dedicate it to other people. Um, so I guess praying for me um, generates faith, and I pray or I prostrate, and, and, and it really just does, it moves me in my faith, and it Confidence. Um, I guess, yeah, confidence is probably one of the main things it gives me in, in what I'm doing. Okay, thank you, Nicola. That's really interesting. And how about you, Aparna? How do you pray and what do you pray? Well, um, so in Hinduism, there's no particular structure to praying or anything. Of course, it's a lot of uh, personal uh, preferences that's uh, present there. So, um, for uh, one common thing that uh, a lot of people uh, go about is meditation and chanting. That's quite uh, common in uh, a, lo a lot of people in the way they pray. Uh, personally, I have, uh, so, uh, so if you go about my daily schedule, I, um, in the morning when I wake up, I say a small prayer to thank God for, you know, uh, allowing me to wake up and, you know, uh, thanking, hoping for a blessed day. And then after I bathe, I normally do, the first thing I do is we have a prayer room uh, and then we, I pray there for, uh, it depends on how much time I have that day. So it could range from five minutes to an hour, depending on my time availability. And then afterwards uh, in the evening, so dawn and dusk are considered the most auspicious time to pray. And so uh, it, obviously dawn is a little difficult depending on when we wake up and stuff like that. But I always make it a point to pray at dusk. And uh, that's when we light a lamp and we pray as well. And uh, uh, some other things, like I've got a few uh, objects that I thought I could show for how we pray. And uh, some, uh, one of the objects that I have is a bell. So this bell is quite, a uh, bell is something you would find in most uh, Hindu households and temples where we ring a bell during prayers. And then we have uh, lamps that we light. So uh, at dawn and dusk, so in the morning and in the evening. So this is, sorry, it's a bit of a heavy one. This is from grass. So uh, the, that's some lamps that I have. And we light incenses, incense as well incense sticks and especially in the evening because of in India you have a lot of mosquitoes and generally incense drives away mosquitoes so that's well purpose and uh, so we have a lot of objects that we use during prayer as well and uh, the it's uh, the benefits of praying for myself is that it helps a lot with both my mental and my physical health so it brings me a lot of peace of mind and also since everybody in the family regularly prays, uh, we sometimes, especially now during lockdown, we take the time to pray together. So it becomes a little bit of time that we spend together as a family. Great, thanks Varna. Nice to see all those different objects. 
Nicola, do you have any objects that you use when you're praying? Yeah, I do actually. I have mala beads. So they are, there's 108, which is an auspicious number, but I don't know why, but it's an auspicious number, I think, in a lot of religions, actually. Um, so we would go round... So we'd go around the mala, we call it, and we'd say mantras or prayers. And it really just focuses the mind. It's just an aid to focus the mind um, and to keep, um, yeah, single points. So you're focusing on what you're saying and your thoughts aren't drifting around to other things, essentially. So use that during meditation and some prayers, but also during the day, sometimes when I just need to, to focus a little. <laughs> Great, thank yeah. you. And I, I, yeah, I've seen those beads in quite a few different religions. So yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Um, so Aparna, you mentioned a bit earlier about um, going to temple. And I was just wondering, Nicola, do you have a place of worship that you go to as well? Normally, um, I try to visit um, the Tibetan monastery Sami Ling down in Dumfries as often as I can. Um, it's the first and largest Tibetan monastery uh, in the West and was co-founded by one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Akon Tulku Rinpoche. Um, and his brother, uh, who's the abbot of Samueling Lama Yeshi, he's still there. So I do go down there to get some um, teachings. Um, he's always available for questions and to help me in my practice. But it's actually a really beautiful place to visit. There's a, a large monastic population there of monks and nuns. Um, and it's a very peaceful place, which actually helps um, one of the reasons actually why I like to go is the environment. It creates a really, it's an environment that's created um, to practice the Dharma. So it's, um, it's focused on the Dharma. So it keeps your mind focused and it's, it helps actually. But to be honest, um, there's no real necessity to visit special buildings um, as a Buddhist. Um, you can really just practice anywhere. Anywhere is fine. But this is a, it's a very, I do like to go. Yeah, I do like to go. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Nicola. And I'm wondering, um, some more questions here we have, do you wear any special clothes or eat mm. any special foods to go to the monastery or in your daily life? So I'm a lay person, which means I'm not a monk or a nun. Um, so there's no requirement for me to wear anything special. And similarly, there's no particular food that's special to Buddhism uh, that I know of. Um, I suppose most Buddhists are vegetarian, uh, which is a really good thing to do, but it's not actually a requirement of being a Buddhist. You can be a Buddhist and eat meat also. So nothing nothing in particular. Okay, thank you. And how about you, Aparna? Any special clothes you wear or special foods that you eat? Well, you can see the clothes part in the video, of course, because uh, of course I've not addressed it so far. So um, one of the things uh, India is famous for is a special dress called sari. So basically it's a six yard long material that you drape, uh, mostly women generally drape around themselves and it comes in lots of colors and patterns and you know uh, everybody likes to wear a good uh, you know sari and it's not just Hindus, everybody in India and everybody in the world, I mean Francis does as well, you get to uh, have so many, you have so many choices uh, when it comes to sari. So this particular sari that I'm wearing uh, is green and there's a peacock. Uh, there are peacocks embroidery uh, throughout the sari. I've got like a few other uh, saris of mine to show you as well. Uh, so this is a nice red one that I wore for my wedding. And these pictures are there of musical instruments. So that's got that print throughout. And this is surprisingly enough, these are Egyptian pharaohs on a sari. So, you know, you've got a bit of mixed culture going on here. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen as well to show you a little bit. This is obviously, I, you cannot see the entire look of what the sari looks like when I'm born it. I'm just going to show you a picture of the different ways you can drape a sari and what that looks like. So on the screen, you can obviously see uh, so some of these are some traditional clothes, Indian clothes that men wear. So this is called a dhoti and this as well. So that's just different ways of tying the same cloth. And this is called a kurta. Uh, um, then this is how a sari looks. So these are the different kinds, different ways in which you can drape a sari. And this is essentially what I'm wearing right now. This is how I look, obviously. Uh, in, uh, you can, uh, unfortunately, you cannot see this, 
So when I go to schools normally, I take time out at the end of my presentation to cite stories for the so for some students who would like to volunteer for it, and everybody always enjoys <laughs> it a lot. Uh, so some other aspects of our dressing is this is something that is you know I like to bring up. It's a fun aspect of Hinduism, which is I mean in Indian culture basically, and I think Muslims have it as well. It's called the mehendi or henna. So uh, this is basically from a leaf of a tree that you use, uh, make into a paste, and then draw designs on your hands and your feet. And we generally do it during festivals, which looks and it looks really, really pretty with our colorful clothes. Um, and we, a lot of married Hindu women have two rings that they wear. Uh, so uh, rather than a ring on your finger, it's more of a two ring that is a common practice. Mm. And so. Uh, come so that's a bit about the dressing specific dresses and all that and here we have some pictures of some food that we have especially during festivals so a very common practice in south of india is to eat food from a banana leaf so bananas grow in abundance uh, banana plantations are uh, present throughout south india because of the hot temperature and so to be, to be eco friendly we like to eat from banana leaves and uh, a very uh, no, low, little known fact is that eating from a banana leaf actually enhances the taste of the food, especially if you serve it hot. So it's really, really, and you we can make out the difference actually from, you know, when you eat over a, from a plate and uh, when you eat from banana leaf. And it's something we do mostly now during festivals, but I, I for me, anytime eating from banana leaf is fine for me. And uh, of course, you see rice is a common food item in uh, India with a lot of curries and chutneys. Uh, and you have all these different types of crisps from made from banana uh, and from rice, uh, rice flour and everything. Uh, this particular uh, is a fried dough uh, mix. So basically, it looks like a donut, but it's uh, from uh, a specific kind of lentil. And uh, of course, these are, you know, uh, Indian culture and, you know, Indian weddings especially are known for serving very, very massive feasts for everybody to enjoy. Thank you, Aparna. That looked very interesting and very tasty as well. So my next questions are a little bit more about how your faith affects your day-to-day -day life and your beliefs. So the first question we have is, what does your religion tell you about how to treat people? So I'll ask you that first to Nicola. Okay, so for, be, for me, being a Buddhist is about doing your best to be a kind human being. And there are some guidance about that. Um, I, there's five in particular, but I'll give you three examples. So the first would be to protect life and refrain from killing. So no killing. To respect others' property and refrain from stealing and to speak the truth and refrain from lying. So that's three out of the five um, that are there to act as, as guides. Super, thank you. How about you, Parna? Well, I think uh, that's, uh, we have quite similar ones in Hinduism as well. And um, uh, one of the things that, it, that is, it's present as a Sanskrit phrase, which is the language of our scriptures, which I'm going to translate for you now. And basically it says that it's about helping everybody. And it says that God gave us a body to help others. And by others, this means all living things. Like it's not just other human beings, animals, mm -hmm. even plants, every other living organism in the world. And uh, they, uh, of course, another something that is heavily stressed upon is don't hurt anybody. So be it with your words or your actions, uh, hurting anybody is a big no-no. And uh, uh, from a very young age, we're always taught to respect everybody and treat everybody equally. So that is something my parents, my grandparents have always taught me uh, from a very young age. And a lot of our scriptures stress on those as well. So yeah, uh, that uh, these are some of the teachings from our scriptures that are really important. Brilliant, thank you. And that seems to be the same across a lot of <laughs> asking people to treat each other the way you would like to be treated and how um Nicola does that affect the way that you live your life well so my religion actually plays quite a large part in my life as I try to follow my teacher's advice and to really focus on my actions 
um, how I treat people, how words can be hurtful, for example. Uh, I try to think, I try to really think about how I behave. And maybe, maybe through time, if I can understand how the mind works a little bit, um, I can then be of benefit to others. Super, thank you. And how about you, Parna? Well, um, like I said, uh, in Hinduism, it's all about treating everybody equally. So part of that is uh, if, you know, obviously when it comes to wealth distribution in the world and in every, I mean, every country of the world, it's not equal. Uh, so charity comes from the fact that, you know, uh, wealth should be uh, distributed among everybody equally. And so uh, Hinduism teaches us a lot about charity. And, you know, if you have excess, don't hold it, you know, give it to those who uh, are in need as well. So uh, be it, you know, just feeding somebody uh, with the extra food that you have. So this has taught me to value everything in life because there are those who don't have the things that I have the privilege of having. So, uh, you know, a wastage is a big no-no in our household and um, be it food or materials. And so um, when... When we can, we try to reuse and recycle as much as possible. And so that, you know, wastage is minimum because obviously we can't go with zero wastage. We try to, you know, um, uh, minimize it as much as we can. So when it comes to, say, for spoiled food or, you know, uh, anything like that, we use it as natural manure for our plants. So again, that's not wasted. And uh, so this has basically been something that has been inculcated from a very young age so I think uh, yeah hopefully I continue to follow that um, throughout yeah okay thank you so now I have a quite interesting question and that is what is it like living your faith in Scotland today Nicola so Buddhism is not historically a religion in Scotland that has been widely embraced in fact Tibetan Buddhism has spread and flourished around the world pretty recently in the last half of the 20th century. Um, but I really had no opposition to converting and taking refuge as a Buddhist. In fact, my family are very supportive and are even interested in the teachings themselves. Um, but I find Scotland to be a very embracing society and it welcomes people of all faiths. And I'm very lucky to be able to practice my faith um, without fear. Great, thank you. That's super. What about you, Parna? Yeah, I think uh, I would echo what uh, Nicola said as well about Council um, Scotland, you know, uh, embracing uh, all faiths and cultures uh, with, you know, broad mind. Um, uh, so um, one of the, uh, any, if, if any challenges that I have, because having grown up in India where, you know, faith is in my household, in my street, in the near next door uh, household as well, you know, everybody, it's a big community of Hindus here, whereas in Scotland, the community is relatively small. So, but uh, one of the, uh, one of the, you know, the silver lining in that scenario is that because the community is so small in Scotland, we are so close. Like everybody, we all visit the same campus and so we get to know each other a lot. And one of the things that has, uh, touch me really is I moved to Scotland just uh, about um, uh, three years back and when I did and I found obviously the first thing I did was seek out the Hindu community in Scotland and everybody was so welcoming and it was so supportive and they helped me so much you know so that I could get used to living in a completely new country and uh, it, to this day like they were like my parents away from home so everybody uh, took care of us. They were always there to clarify any doubts, uh, tell me where I can shop for, you know, Indian uh, uh, food, made, uh, you know, Asian uh, stores, where, which are the best ones and where I can get my, you know, regular gro uh, Indian grocery. And that uh, it all helped me settle down really fast in Glasgow and the atmosphere uh, was so warm and cozy that they provided. It was like, you know, settling down home again. Uh, so yeah, uh, of course, there are some challenges in the sense that there are a lot of practices that we have at home here that unfortunately I'm not able to do there because of, you know, uh, lack of, you know, just resources and stuff. But I think the temple, having a temple there uh, has really helped me overcome those. Yeah. Okay. 
Now I've got a really interesting question here and this is from S1 Pupils at Craigie High School in Dundee and their question is why are there so many different beliefs in the world? If either of you would like to answer that one. Yeah well um, personally I think uh, if you think about the religions started uh, as a concept a very long time ago, like thousands of years ago, when the world wasn't as connected as it is right now, because obviously now we have the internet and then there are so many ways of traveling quickly around the world. We're so much more connected now across the world than we were back then. So because of this, it was much more difficult to share, you know, thoughts and ideas back then, you know, across long distances. And it was rather more localized within their area that, you know, these thoughts and, you know, opinions were shared. And so uh, different religions started, I think, based on being, uh, you know, within that particular area. Like I mentioned in the first question that, you know, Hinduism uh, started in the Asian subcontinent because people in the nearby regions, the uh, thoughts and the opinions could be shared much more easily within this region than, you know, probably in the, uh, across to Europe. So um, uh, my, uh, I think personally, I would believe that, you know, different religions started basically as an appreciation for nature and creation. And uh, so uh, then, you know, uh, and so which obviously has a factor in where, uh, which obviously plays into where you are as well, because each country has its own different, you know, some are hilly, some are mountainous, some are coastal. So that obviously influences how you think about your, um, you know, about God and how you think about faith. And so they all developed in, you know, little pockets throughout the world in different times and different ways. So it all turned up separately. So sort of like languages, I would say, because, you know, you have so many different languages across the world. But, you know, uh, end of the day, we may speak differently in different languages, but I think the messages end up being the same. So I think that's uh, how I would say, uh, I mean, that's why I believe there are so many different faiths in the world. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. And that's interesting what you said there at the end about the messages being the same, because actually our last question is, what do you think religions share in common? So I'll ask that to each of you. So I don't know if you'd like to finish off with what you're saying there, Parna, about what religions share in common. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think most of the religions ask people to be kind, you know, practice charity, charity, being helpful and, you know, being generous in your life. Uh, so these are all the ideologies that are, uh, you know, treating everybody equally and respectfully. These are ide ideologies that I, are, I think, present in every religion. And then uh, besides ideology, there are certain aspects about religion, uh, like, you know, in terms of objects that are used as well, that are quite common. Like I believe uh, Nicola showed us this prayer beads. A lot of, you know, well, uh, different other religions, including Hinduism, uh, there are people who use those. And, you know, um, lamps and candles, you know, the theme of light uh, is uh, light and you know bells these are some things that are present in a lot of uh, other religions as well and I really like the idea of you know uh, a lamp or a candle being uh, used in different faiths because it all signifies the fact about you know light and bringing light to the world and bringing uh, light to everybody which is a very beautiful aspect that I think is present in every faith. Great thank you lovely. Um, so I'll finish with you then, Nicola, on the same question. What do you think religions share in common? Uh, kindness is probably one common thread. Um, and my understanding is that all religions seek freedom from suffering. Um, and there are many ways of achieving this. And religions, perhaps, um, offer many roads to the same destination. Um, but I do think that religion is a very personal experience. Um, and there's so many different paths that people can take and so many journeys that people are going to take uh, and so many remedies, actually. Um, and with the help of your, your religion, it can, um, it can guide you really in the best direction that suits you personally. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nicola. Well, that's us coming to the end of our show now. It's been really brilliant to hear from both um, Nicola and Aparna today. I've certainly learned a lot. And uh, I hope you have too. So thanks and bye for now. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>